So uh, welcome everyone to the, the afternoon session of the Sustainability Forum. Uh, my name is Chip McMillan. I'm with the School of Education at UAS here. And I'm going to introduce my two friends and colleagues, uh, Travis and Anthony from Seek Solutions. They're going to talk to us about biodiesel. Take it away, guys. So I'm Travis. You want to stand up? This is, this is Anthony. And uh, we're going to present this piece together. We're from a group called Seek Solutions, uh, Southeast Alaska Solutions. And uh, to be transparent, we are not actually a legal entity. <laughs> uh, I guess out of this uh, panel of presenters, <coughs> these rock stars that you have, we're like the garage band. But, uh, there are some good songs that have come from garage bands, you know? Um, we're in the process of filing uh, for nonprofit status and working through the paperwork there. Yeah, that helps. Thanks. Um, so most of our business is done in the pub or at the library, and uh, we're getting it done. Six months ago, we met over at Silver Bow, and we were having a conversation. We learned that we were both interested in finding personal um, and creative ways of solving our energy needs. And so Anthony and I started talking about a variety of things. We sort of uh, honed in on powering our vehicles with alternative fuels. And I have a veg oil car. First, I'll just show you some of these here. In recognition of um, the increasing cost of the energy that we use, So in recognition of that, we decided to take some personal action and responsibility for the personal energy that we consume. And our point of origin uh, was this conversation that we had talking about this veg oil car I have. It has a conversion kit which uses waste vegetable oil uh, to power it. And unfortunately, it was messy and time consuming and I'm not really a mechanic. So I was hoping to find someone who could help me uh, learn how to uh, make biodiesel. And that's where Anthony came in. I found that person. Anthony has spent time all over our country and around the world uh, working with different vi uh, biodiesel productions and, and biodiesel um, ventures. ventures. And he went around the world on a boat powered by biodiesel. And so generally when you think of waste vegetable oil, alternative fuels, you think of some guy in a bus, uh, some hippie, and uh, he's going from place to place begging for, for old French fry oil from the McDonald's along the way, the Burger King. And then he parks on the side of the road and does his little filtering and cleaning process and then puts it into his vehicle which has a conversion kit but not all uh, alternatively fueled vehicles look like that. This is called the EcoJet. It was created by GM, designed by Jay Leno. This is his car. It uh, has 650 horsepower, <laughs> uh, and it runs on biofuels. Um, nothing about this car has anything to do with economy. <laughs> <laughs> or sustainability, but you know there there are vehicles that are being made that can still be trendy uh, and use alternative fuels. So the dilemma for me was waste vegetable oil or biodiesel, and this is an example of some of the hardware that you need to do a conversion for a waste vegetable oil powered car, and. Uh, you know, it costs a bit of money, and it's time-consuming, and it's messy, as I said. So Anthony and I started to talk about biodiesel. And we opened up our conversation to the community, and we started to build this group that we're calling Seek Solutions, Southeast Alaska Solutions. Uh, we held some uh, forums and some lectures and some workshops. We've had quite a bit of interest 
here in Juneau, people interested in finding alternative energy sources. And uh, we looked at a lot of different things from small scale uh, wind generation and hydro power uh, to biofuels, uh, to fish oil, to French fry cars. And uh, this is Andy, and he's the engineer at the Baranoff. And they've converted their boilers at the Baranoff to run off of uh, waste vegetable oil. So Anthony pretty much has the corner market on the waste vegetable, Andy, yeah, Andy, sorry, uh, waste vegetable oil here in Juneau. But he's a good guy, and he's been working with us and hanging out. And uh, he's a creative thinker and a guy that takes action. So uh, over the past few months, Anthony and I have uh, realized that um, you know this personal interest that we have could maybe be a community uh, function and something that more people might want to be interested in. And our ambition is not to just you know rehash information. Um, uh, but we do want to exchange information and give people uh, new ideas and new creative ways that they could find to sustain their energy needs. Uh, we also wanted to have practical, uh, get your hands dirty, get your feet wet opportunities for people. So we've started these workshops where we just come together and we try a variety of different um, small-scale means of reducing our energy usage or creating or generating. And we're convinced that individual ownership is really important for us as we look at how Juno uh, can solve its energy sustainability. And we want to find a diversity of creative methods to supplement the large infrastructure projects such as hydroelectricity that we've been talking a lot about because those projects, which we need to keep as our foundation, you know, when they're in development, they take 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, but we need to find ways that individuals can have solutions, can have small and diverse and creative ways to generate energy. And so, uh, in order to be responsible, uh, we as Seek Solutions are uh, encouraging people to get involved themselves. And so we organized a forum where these individuals came together, and this is sort of the vision that we've come up with. We want to connect conviction with opportunity. We want to find creative energy solutions. We want to discover the feasibility of making and using biodiesel in Juno. Anthony's going to speak to that in a minute. And we want to network groups and individuals to share their experiences and their information. So that's an overview of our project. And Anthony's going to share some details about what biodiesel is and is not and how we plan to produce it. Hello. Uh, so biodiesel is, uh, is a lot of misconceptions. And, uh, just want to kind of address straight away. Biodiesel is not uh, using vegetable oil. It is a vegetable oil or animal oil based fuel, but it's not just pouring Crisco into your tank and going. It's uh, actually recognized by the Environmental Protection Agency as a registered alternative fuel. And they have a series of laws uh, and acts, rather, that have been passed by Congress and amended over the years called EPACT. And that's a requirement that fleets that are fairly funded. Uh, procure a certain amount of alternatively fueled vehicles when they make their fleet purchases. And biodiesel actually qualifies for that. If you uh, have a diesel vehicle and you burn the equivalent of 450 gallons of biodiesel in, your, in that vehicle, you qualify for an alternative fuel credit, which is uh, pretty handy. And uh, it's uh, a really easy way for fleet managers and people who are seeking those credits to come into federal compliance to fall into play. That way they don't have to purchase this whole new infrastructure for them to, uh, in order to meet those credits. And the uh, chemistry of biodiesel is pretty straightforward. It's actually one of the least intensive uh, chemical uh, reactions you can have as opposed to like a, a still or something that's really energy intensive. It's uh, generally a large, uh, or a base catalyzed reaction called transesterification with an alcohol and an ester. And you use a catalyst, usually a uh, potassium or sodium hydroxide. 
And the result is what you get is this chain. Uh, on the left there, you see uh, that's a triglyceride. And by this catalyst, you get uh, two products, essentially. You get a fatty acid methyl ester, which is the chemical name for biodiesel. And you also get a by byproduct of glycerin, which is what you find in common products like hair care products and the like. It's, uh, it's a pretty ubiquitous uh, chemical. Biodiesel is uh, it's renewable. And uh, it's especially renewable when you consider the usage of waste streams like fish oil or waste vegetable oil. These things have already seen their primary usage, so any more usage of that product is, is uh, it's an effective thing. It's not necessarily the definition of renewable, but most of the, uh, uh, well, I could actually say all of the sources of biodiesel are from renewable things, be they raising farm animals and, and rendering them down or uh, raising soybean or growing algae. Uh, it's energy efficient, and I'll address that on the next slide. Uh, and there's also the displacement of petroleum, which in these days and times is becoming of a paramount concern due to national security and other economic uh, pinches we're feeling now that are affecting how we, uh, we, we do our body politic internationally. It can be used without modification into any infrastructure, uh, existing for diesel rather. So you don't have to convert your vehicles or your fueling stations or anything like that, like if you did a hydrogen economy you'd have to convert all these vehicles, run a hydrogen or buy new hydrogen vehicles. And then you'd have to actually uh, convert the whole fueling station. It's a really energy intensive thing. And it's uh, something to consider when you, we spent over 100 years getting to the point we are now, where you can go to any corner station and buy petroleum. You know, it's taken a long time to get there. And I'm sure a lot of you will remember how hard it was to find diesel. Uh, like in, even in 1980, if you had a Mercedes or something, you had to drive a long way, usually to these really seedy truck stops just to fill your really nice Mercedes that you just got. So it's uh, taken um, quite a while to get diesel available um, all over the country. It uh, reduces global warming, and uh, by that it's, uh, it's carbon imprint and how you take carbon out of the, uh, out of the earth and, and put it up into the air, and I'll explain that cycle in the next slide as well. Reduces tailpipe emissions. It's uh, non-toxic. It can be U.S. grown, which is really important, and it's easy to use. Uh, it's often used as a blend. Um, in these days, we have uh, ultra-low sulfur diesels being mandated by the government in order to uh, prevent pollution and uh, reduce tailpipe emissions for pollution. And uh, what that does, the sulfur actually provides a lubrication for the fuel, which is really important when you're running a car and everyone touts the longevity of diesel engines. Well, when you take away that lubrication, the longevity is actually going to be something of concern because the fuel is no longer providing its own lubrication, and the friction can cause a, a breakdown that will be uh, exacerbated by this fuel. Uh, petroleum diesel, ultra low sulfur diesel. But the inclusion of 5% blend of biodiesel with petroleum diesel actually increases the lubricity of the fuel by 60%. So you can imagine what that will do is you scale up that blend from 5% above. B20 is just a term for general usage. It's the one that's kind of accepted overall by engine manufacturers, and, and uh, it's the federal minimum federal requirement for EPAC credits. So it's kind of the, the baseline use for uh, when you're discussing biodiesel. And then there's the 100% or NEAT biodiesel, B100. And that's what people uh, generally would like to use. You know, that way it'd be 100% renewable. And why is it so great? You have a positive energy balance with biodiesel. And by that means is that for all the process of making biodiesel, from planting a seed, growing it, pressing it, converting the oil into a fuel, you get a 3.2 to 1 positive energy balance. So for every one barrel of oil you put in to produce that fuel, you get 3.2 barrels of oil in energy. So it's a... Uh, so it's a real positive thing, and it's actually eight to one with WVO, waste vegetable oil, because you're using that secondary usage of that product. Another good thing about biodiesel is that it's uh, about 11% oxygen by weight, which means that it's a highly oxidized fuel, which ensures a more complete combustion. And by having a more complete combustion, you have less pollution going out of your tailpipe. Much of the fuel that is burned 
uh, or is, is, that it goes into your fuel system is actually not burned. And that's where you see those really nasty belching, oily black soot streams coming out of the stacks of uh, trucks is when they put the coals down. They're injecting a lot of fuel that actually doesn't get burned and it just kind of, it just kind of smolders out and that's the black smoke essentially. And uh, you can look at this graph and what we have here, this is a setup so by the blend of biodiesel that you use, these are reductions in some of the emissions you have. You have a uh, you have up to a fi almost 50% reduction by using B100 of uh, particulate matter, and that's uh, soot and the like. And that particulate matter is actually recognized by the uh, EPA as being uh, uh, a, health, a health concern. It's actually a cancerous causing agent, and uh, it's, uh, it's something that the EPA has become intensely concerned about, especially when you consider that a large target population of these cancer-causing agents are children riding on school buses, especially with an aging, decrepit school bus system, and these buses last for so long. Uh, it's something that is becoming of, of high concern. And you see that the more biodiesel you use, the less of these cancer-causing agents you have in the emissions. You also have uh, this uh, marked decrease in unburned hydrocarbons, which is the blue line. And those are the unburned uh, fuel. and. Uh, that's, that's a really important thing to uh, think about when you're talking about reducing pollution. And you can see that biodiesel has a, an incredibly marked uh, uh, impact on that. The, uh, slight, the red line is uh, nitrogen oxide, which is a smog-producing uh, gas. There is a slight increase with the use of biodiesel, but that can normally be taken care of by adjustments in engine timing and some other technological fixes like catalytic converters. And it's, it's nothing, it's, it's of concern, but it's being uh, uh, attacked by uh, the body science. So it, it should be reduced quite significantly in the coming years. It's not perfect. It uh, has a little bit less uh, BTUs, which is basically the ability to hold heat and energy, than uh, number two diesel. But with better cetane, smoother running, easier starting, and a better burn, and the higher oxygen content, overall, it. Uh, you have a better impact with running it in your engine. The cold flow issues are important to consider because you have a higher cloud point depending on what feedstock you use. And up here in Alaska, that could be of a, a paramount concern because if you can't flow your fuel, then you can't use it. But that can be uh, addressed by feedstock uh, choices like uh, canola or rapeseed or even fish oil. Fish oil has very good cold flow properties. Uh, and also some mechanical means. You can use it by heating your fuel or just agitating it, and uh, that, that can uh, help take care of that. It has a, I mentioned this slight increase in nitrogen oxide. And it's a good solvent, which means that if you put it into your old truck, all the sludge that's been building up over the years and decades of running that truck in the uh, bottom of the tank actually gets broken up and stirred up by the biodiesel, and it's cleaning the tank. But the only place for it to go through is your fuel filter. So you have to change your fi filter a couple few times. But after that, you have a really clean fuel system, and uh, it's all the better. So I'm going to read this. It's uh, why B20 is such a popular thing. The National Re uh, Renewable Energy Lab says B20 is a popular because it represents a good balance of cost, emissions, cold weather performance, materials compatibility, and solvency. B20 is also the minimum blend that can be used for the EPAC compliance for covered fleets. Alaska has uh, quite a few projects that are going on with biodiesel. There have been some long-running ones and ones that are just starting up like ours. And this is kind of a short list. And I'll put this presentation up on our website so you guys can uh, have access to it if you'd like access to this list. But I just want to show you that just, just now and for the past few years, there are quite a many projects that are going on, and there are more to come. Uh, the Denali Commission received a record number of uh, applications for some of their grant money. And uh, a lot of them had to deal with biodiesel in general. So um, in Alaska, there are a few ways to get it. Uh, the most straightforward way is just to buy it and import it. Uh, and you can do bulk purchases by in a cooperative sense. You can purchase it yourself directly by barrel by barrel. Um, but probably what people are mostly looking for is producing it locally because you're going to reduce all those transport costs associated with it. And you have a couple of uh, uh, concepts here. You have fleet biodiesel, which would be used like 
by school buses in the school and the transit system and other uh, generally for-profit kind of entities that run a certain amount of vehicles and generators and they want to uh, get this particular type of fuel at this particular kind of uh, rating um, and standard. And then they're the backyard people who make biodiesel in their backyard and just run it in their truck or running it in their home heating. And I believe that's what most people are, are concerned about. In the course of our travels here, Travis and I have uh, discovered a lot of different entities are very interested. And uh, one of them, let me just show you this picture. This is the typical backyard biodiesel thing. This is, you can tell by the pristine laboratory conditions here that a quality fuel is gonna come out. But this is, this is how it goes. It, like Travis was saying, it's dirty, it's kind of messy, um, it tends to cause lots of divorces or at least breakups because you have this fetish in your backyard and they can't use it anymore. So, uh, you know, yeah, you're running a renewable energy, but you're doing it alone. So they have, the, this is the kind of thing that we're trying to avoid by providing a, a, a more of a community-oriented uh, uh, hands-on, we're trying to find spaces and, you know, we're getting partnerships with different entities and people. And we've come up with a few options. One is to kind of shy away from this and go more towards this. This is uh, called a BioPro. This company approached us uh, from the positive media exposure we had that was actually picked up by the Associated Press and sent all around the country. And we got a call by the makers of this and they were like, love what you guys are doing. I think we can help. And it kind of filed it away and like, uh, you, know, you know, people are trying to you know, sell you something. But then I got in a chat with them and the guy named Danny Lessa, he developed this, we were one of the developers of this. He was like, Man, no, we're just super interested in helping you guys. You guys, there's such an amazing problem with uh, need of energy in, in Alaska. You guys feel it more than most other places in the United States. So we started talking and uh, they're actually gonna come up here and help us fine tune this. And, uh, we were like, okay, and we, we figured out that this, this one can produce, the estimated 15,000 gallons annually. But with a little bit of infrastructure improvements, we can actually double that capacity for production of this and get over 30,000 gallons of biodiesel, B100. Around the same time that we were contacted about this, a gentleman named Jeff Hastings, who is the owner of Taku Tours, he's one of the uh, uh, recently addressed cruise ship operators, one of the uh, uh, the questionnaires earlier uh, mentioned the cruise ship buses, the tour buses going around picking up people from the ships and going to the salmon bakes and the glacier and how there needs to be an infrastructure improvement. And Jeff has been rattling around this head for about six months now and he actually attended and his intention was to make it himself and try to start this thing on his own. So he contacted us and he was wondering if there's anything he could do. So. Uh, he he's a, he's a, has a native owned business, and um, we started working with between him, the Clinkett Haida Central Council, and we tried to figure out a way how could we get his company running on renewable fuel in a cost efficient manner. <coughs> and uh, when it, his his reasoning, and also Central Council's reasoning for getting involved in biodiesel, there, it's more than just the how much does it hurt my wallet thing. They have a uh, uh, an absolute need to uh, do things when considering environmental stewardship and social justice. So even if it costs a little bit more, their intention is to do it because it's the right thing to do and they want to get away from petroleum dependence and they want to not have such a health effects, uh, negative health effect on their customers and the, the people that they're charged with protecting and, uh, and helping. So. Uh, there's also some other good things about it when you consider that the, you're a tour operator and you expect an increase in European tourists to come here. They have a really big green energy bent. And anyone who's ever been to Europe or talked to Europeans, they're kind of amazed at how blind we are to renewable energy and how, how much in the dark we are. We're pretty much medieval when they've been doing biodiesel and biofuels for over 15 years, and they have it completely set up, and it's, it's like cell phones today. You know, it didn't exist before, but now it's ubiquitous. And so their, Jeff's assumption is that he will actually get an increase in business and tourism just by using biodiesel. So we uh, went, 
contacted these people, we worked with the different central council, and we had to figure out how to feed this. And there's a kind of a shortage of feedstock, and that's really the mother of any kind of biodiesel production, is like, how are you going to make it work? How are you going to feed it? How are you going to get this fuel? And the idea was like, local stocks are the best way. But uh, there is a somewhat local entity up in Anchorage, Alaska, called Alaska Mill and Feed, that has had an excess of waste vegetable oil for quite some time. And they've had a lot of people wanting to deal with them, uh, try, try to you know, help them figure out what to do. So uh, we contacted them, and we've been working with them uh, through uh, Will Tagan, who's uh, part of uh, the biodiesel network up in Anchorage. And we come to this agreement where we're going to share some technical expertise in order to improve their infrastructure, how they collect vegetable oil, and how they filter it and process it, because they don't want to get involved with biodiesel at all. But they were a family operation, and they want to keep it local. And uh, they're kind of ashamed of how much money they're making <laughs> at selling their waste vegetable oil for over two fifty dollars a gallon by shipping it down to Seattle. And so they'd rather sell it less and make less of a profit, but keep it local. Uh, it's it's uh, one of those weird good old boy things that they just want to do the right thing, because you know, it's like, eh, that's, that's what we want to do. So what we figured out is that by partnering with the uh, Alaska Mill and Feed and getting as much help to them as they need to get them to that point, they're willing to provide us 30,000 gallons of waste vegetable oil, the capacity um, that we hope to get for this BioPro annually, uh, for at least a couple years, maybe more. And we want to have it at a fixed rate uh, that we hope to uh, keep as stable as possible, unless there's some crazy waste vegetable oil fire or some uh, tragedy. But we have a, an agreement tentatively with them that we would be able to provide uh, the feedstock to members of Seek Solutions, to uh, Taku Tours, and also any other entity such as Clinkett Haida Central Council in order to produce biodiesel for, veg for vehicle operation or uh, home heating oil supplementation. So what we have established now is uh, everything's lined up ready to go that will be starting production potentially by July. And what that will allow us to do is produce 30,000 gallons of biodiesel from July to July or 150,000 gallons of waste vegetable oil, or uh, correction, B20. That's purely from waste vegetable oil. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a neat thing. And I, I'd like to kind of invite Travis up here to also discuss our relationship with uh, Central Council and how we hope to uh, benefit them and the, some of the villages that they serve. So uh, if you want to get onto our website, it's seeksolutions.org, and there's a 1-800 number you can call to get a hold of us. Uh, w let's bring up the house lights, and we're going to field some questions in a minute. And Chip, you can cut us off as soon as we need to get going. Uh, so uh, Seek Solutions is uh, in the process of getting a grant so that we can have an administrator, which Anthony and I are in desperate need of. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, we're also working with the Clinkett and Haida Council, as Anthony said. We're working specifically with projects in Angoon and Yakutat, and we're trying to do some small-scale um, energy conservation, some small-scale energy solutions, and try to do it in one community, in one village, and see what dramatic impact it could make if we focused all our efforts in one location. So, uh, and that's what the council is interested in doing as well. There's a real need in rural Alaska. You may have read the articles or heard the term energy refugees. All these people fleeing, like uh, some some places have had, mm -hmm. I think, 15 to 40 percent in the last two years of their population. Out. Yeah, move out of these villages uh, because they can't afford to live there. So. They think within three years they have to find a solution or the uh, communities will cease to exist. And so that's their interest in that. Um, if you want to give some feedback uh, or get connected with Seek Solutions, uh, go to our website and you can sign up for our mailing list. Also, we have weekly uh, just informal workshops where we're exploring different alternative energy things. We're still working on this biodiesel piece. But we also just have some sort of 
grassroots backyard projects that we're experimenting with, trying to get uh, technology and information into people's hands so that individuals can take that personal responsibility to find solutions for themselves. So in the couple minutes we have left, uh, we'll just field a couple questions. And if you'll wait uh, until you have the microphone to ask a question, then everybody else can hear it. So I'll do my best to be fast. And uh, we can talk outside as well after. It's, it seems to me that um, uh, when you're talking about biodiesel using waste oil, it's obviously a good thing. And uh, so I have no, no uh, debate about that. However, I've read um, a number of articles, uh, both about ethanol and biodiesel, which um, are very convincing that it's not the way to go <clears throat> in terms of reducing uh, dependence on foreign oil because it takes uh, as much oil to produce the um, crop as you're going to get out of it. So anyway, I'd like to, I'd, I'm curious as to whether, uh, in terms of the solutions you're proposing, you're proposing, you know, more of a of a uh, using waste oil, or are you, you because you use the term feedstock in a fairly generic way. And I just w wanted to hear your comments on that. Okay. Okay, I'll take that. Um, yeah, we we don't advocate large scale. Uh, biodiesel production in a way that's going to impact agriculture or or um, you know our land, um, and we're looking for a diversity of solutions for energy needs here in Juneau. I think that biodiesel is one opportunity we have with waste vegetable oil surpluses. It's not something that everybody in Juneau can go out and buy a diesel vehicle and we'll be able to provide biodiesel for them. But this is one piece of the puzzle that we're looking for. Also, as Biodiesel progresses, there is new technologies de being developed. Just this last week, they started producing uh, algae in Texas and Arizona to make uh, biodiesel. And what Anthony and I are advocating is that even with the production of biodiesel, that it shouldn't just be one thing. Uh, for instance, uh, corn production for methanol, if that's the only thing our country is going to do, is a really bad idea. And so we'd agree with that. Uh, I had a question on the technical aspects, I guess. In Alaska, and especially southeast Alaska, we used to have canneries in every town, you know, and, and along with those canneries, the folks who worked there remember the head shops, which were where they chopped up all the bellies and the heads, and they boiled it off, and they came up with oil. So is that something that could be used? I'm, I, I would yeah, imagine actually, not. Actually, yeah, and uh, the next presentation, I believe, address, addresses that uh, specifically. Okay, yeah. thanks. How much would uh, the BioPro 380 cost then for like a cannery to buy? It's around, it could produce 100 gallons a day or well, between 24 and 48 hours depending on what cycles you set it on. And it's a $13,000 initial cost. But there are a variety of different machines that you could purchase starting at $1,200 going up to $30,000. Right. This one, this one we chose specifically um, is that it, it addresses a wide variety of uh, uh, feedstocks. It also uses a kind of um, heavy intensive catalyzing so that it's using more catalyst than is necessary, but it's guaranteed more to... It, not guaranteed. It's more likely to provide a quality fuel um, from even pretty poor feedstocks than you would, uh, you know, from the manual testing. There's that backyard uh, rig that would be ideal for, you know, having a, a, a multi feedstock, or if you had one specific, you could you could gear it specifically for that. But this one allows, you know, whatever may come our way, we hope to be able to meet the uh, needs for uh, specific people in Juno and be able to uh, allow, allow them access to be able to use that fuel. I just, uh, I have a question, but um, there's not going to be someone talking about the, the fish oil today, so do you have something to add on that? Uh, yeah, actually. <laughs> okay, uh, so fish oil to biodiesel is being, uh, it's being focused on by a variety of different studies, feasibility studies. There's one being conducted in Sitka, and there's one being conducted here in Juno. Uh, there are quite a variety that have been conducted up in the uh, Dutch area and the uh, chains in conjunction with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and uh, the John Steigers Corporation who is, he worked for um, uh, Alaska Energy Authority or worked with them. Um, 
and uh, they had uh, quite a variety of fish oil pro biodiesel projects. And one of them was actually not even a biodiesel, it was just fish oil as a fuel, where they blended a 50-50 mix of fish oil with uh, diesel and ran into these real giant uh, multi-megawatt diesel generators. And they've been running those successfully. Uh, I think it's something like a million gallons a year of fish oil they're burning through their generators. So there are quite a lot of things available for that. They have some problems specifically that deal with fish oil, though, is that it um, degrades rather quickly. So you have to use it in a, a very specific application pretty quickly. Sometimes you only have a two-week window. And uh, then it starts to have some really negative uh, impacts upon your engine and your infrastructure. So it's an ideal for a place like Sitka or Juno even, that if you have processors set up, that they have to rely upon diesel generation to provide some of the city's power, then you can just make the biodiesel and truck it straight from production right to the generator and it's burned within a few hours. So there are definite some good applications. And also to address the other previous gentleman's questions is that we advocate the utilization of waste streams. And the waste streams that are available in Alaska are, are quite significant when you look at the population that we have to serve here. So um, I, I, I don't really foresee us clearing um, Tongass to grow soybeans, which is fortunate. And uh, you know, we, we hope that the existing, uh, well, there actually is a serious concern, like what if people fish for fuel? But that's gonna be impossible because you'll never have food cost less than fuel. So people always choose food over fuel, except like on corn and stuff yeah. like that. We hope. But like on, on when you're talking about animal products, I mean, you're not going to see big factories where they're dropping pigs and turning out fuel. Because uh, it just, it costs too much to raise them. And it costs too much to go out fishing. And they can make much more money on that. So that's the fortunate side of a, a kind of, you know, strange economy. So now my question. So I'm actually doing a T-Tan conversion right now. And being in Juno, I'm a little worried about the future of like the waste stream associated with, with straight vegetable oil. So I'm wondering, like, do you have any sort of idea of what the capacity is? How many cars can we actually put out there? In that 30,000 gallons that we're importing is going to feed also SVO users. Um, now, the problem is, is that a lot of people would say, well, I mean, if you're importing 30,000 gallons of any liquid, be it feedstock or biodiesel, why not just import biodiesel? But what we had to do is create a regional kind of development center that one will provide education and two, we'll be able to address the needs of a variety of people so that the feedstock itself can be used for whether you're doing waste vegetable in your car, you can burn waste vegetable oil in your burner like the Baranoff does, you can convert it to biodiesel. There are a variety of uh, uses that we hope to be able to uh, uh, make available with that feedstock. So uh, any and all takers, if you guys have any ideas, or if you know anyone that can utilize it, please contact us and let us know, because we need as much help and as ideas as we can get. We're also um, hoping to help people put it into their home heating fuel and to supplement some of that. Yeah. How much just Juno alone can support? Ooh. <laughs> Do you know how much Juno alone can support? Uh, well, let's look at Angoon. Um, Angoon has 220 houses, and you can uh, assume around 100 gallons of fuels burn a month. So yeah, you can extrapolate that. There's absolutely no way that we could support that. Um, but what we can do is that the people who will seek that uh, kind of uh, temporary solution, that that will abate. I mean, we're going to we're going to displace 30,000 gallons of petroleum. That's all we can do. But we're going to displace 30,000 gallons of petroleum, and I, I think that's going to be enough for our efforts right now. And if uh, we can increase it, that'd be great. And uh, if a lot of different entities like do the same thing that we're doing, it won't be 30,000 gallons. It'll be 300,000 gallons, three million gallons. Who knows? But you know, you just have to uh, do. One little step at a time, and eventually you'll see the end, hopefully. And when people in Anchorage stop eating fried fish and french fries, then we'll have to find another solution. Yeah. And that's yeah. sort of what we're thinking. Um, in addition to uh, biofuels, is there any push to develop uh, like bio lubrication? Because along with uh, 
you know, diesel engines running on biofuels, you're still going to be using petroleum-based lubricants. Is there any possibility for that? Yeah, I can point you in some directions. It, that's kind of a, a fetish among biodiesel users. Like, there are people like, you got to go pure, <laughs> you know, and they really do everything they can. But it's kind of hard. Um, you have uh, this chemical process called polymerization, and petroleum can handle it, and animal and vegetables, they... they Petroleum tends not to polymerize, and you know, vegetable and oil, uh, animal oils, are what petroleum were, were a long time ago. But through lots of heat and pressure, it's chemically changed. So, yes, you can do it, but you know, there's there's uh, you'll you'll get a lot more of just burning your fuel. Yeah. Did I ask your question? And uh, just again to highlight, if any of you are interested in uh, doing this, um, we will, you become a member and you have access to the BioPro. And you have access to purchase a feedstock at cost and all the other associated materials at cost. We're an advocacy organization and we're not a business trying to turn a profit by selling uh, alternative fuel. We're trying to allow access to people to make their own fuel and make their own choices. So please do consider uh, joining us and signing up and becoming a part of it. And uh, if you can uh, think of any other skills or attributes or any kind of trades or any kind of neat thing that you have or you can do, or even if you're good at filing, oh God, please, if you're good at filing, <laughs> give, give us a call and uh, contact us via email or talk to us afterwards. And yeah, you know, we'd, we'd really, we'll bake you cookies. I just have, I just have a question. Um, just. So you guys are young guys. You probably didn't finish school too too long ago, and like at least half this room is full of students, you know, and progressive students thinking a lot more progressively than I am, and uh, looking at jobs in the future. And you guys are, I mean, I'm kind of wondering, well, like, paint a picture for us. Like, what's your day job, you know, or are you doing this like all the time? And what can you recommend to students, you know, if they're interested in eco entrepreneurship and and you know, putting some of these ideas into practice? Um, well, Anthony is the real saint here. <laughs> he, he moved to Juneau just to start such a project. And uh, he works at a job that is it's difficult for him to pay his bills so that he can do this. Uh, myself, this is more of a hobby for me. I have a day job. I don't like to tell people because I'm afraid they'll judge me for it. Uh, I'm a pastor. Uh, and. So yeah, I, we, we both work, we don't make any money from this, we just put money into it. And we just basically want to find ways to assist this community to find energy solutions. Um, as, as people that are looking at, for employment in biodiesel, is that what you're asking? Okay, I'd say Google it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're actually, around our country, th there are lists uh, of possible jobs to do with biodiesel production or with green advocacy groups where people could work with alternative energy and uh, but you know it's 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 new but it's growing like crazy so I can actually um, there, there are a couple of things that have come out uh, recently uh, San Juan College down in Farmington New Mexico had one of the first uh, renewable energy programs like a certification program where you can actually get associates in it and you graduate from that program and you're in a week installing solar panels on a roof. There's just such a demand for it. Not to take away from the school here. Uh, but University of Oregon also just started a renewable energy uh, um, bachelor's program. And so there, there's a definite need. University of Iowa has been churning out people in, in chemical and chemistry and business kind of schools in order that are focusing specifically on biofuels in like the agricultural sense. Um, myself, um, the last job I had before my exciting and dynamic career at baggage relocation at Alaska Airlines was, uh, 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 I, was I was a volunteer engineer on a world, around the world circumnavigation running on biodiesel. So I got paid. And you know, I was kind of inspired by my cousin who um, went to med school and he accrued like several hundred thousand dollars worth of debt and then skipped out on it to Cambodia. And he's repairing like kids' broken hands and he's been there for 15, 20 years and they can't collect on him. 
Khmer Rouge have a problem with that. So it's kind of, it's kind of nice, you know, you, you, if, you, if you do stuff, you know, if you want to make money, go sell something, you know, but if you want to do... disclaimer that that's the... Oh, right, yeah, disclaimer, that's my own personal opinion. Uh, but, you know, it's my... If, if you want to make money at things, um, you know, you, you got to go make money. That's, that's just it, and it's, it's the hard road. Um, it's actually hard to make money. It's hard, you know, to do the things you don't want to do in order to make money and buy a house. Very few people get to do really cool things and make money at it. Um, so you see a lot of really poor people doing cool things. <laughs> so we got uh, Travis and Anthony, the, the true uh, thinking globally and acting locally. Um, it's great to have them.